on houseplants. Um, David is going to be discussing some general uh, houseplant topics today. We'll be taking some questions from everybody. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time on one of these webinars, um, if you are on the Zoom call, you can ask your questions by typing them into the Q&A button on the Zoom menu. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook, I'll be keeping an eye on the comments section. So you can actually just write your questions in the comments there. And I'll be taking, uh, taking a look at those throughout the class. And uh, as we have time to take questions, David will be taking those. So David, going to go ahead and let you get started. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. Usually we're talking about some type of gardening uh, activity was going on outside, but I wanted to talk about taking our gardening inside. Uh, and there's so many good reasons to do this, to bring plants into our lives. Uh, it just gives us this opportunity to explore a whole collection of different plants that, uh, that otherwise we wouldn't be growing here because we're talking about plants that are not necessarily hardy, uh, winter hardy outside. So things uh, that, you know, tropical plants primarily we bring into the homes and get to enjoy that and enjoy the whole experience of nurturing the plants and learning about them. And many of us might not have large areas outside. So there's lots and lots of good reasons to uh, explore this whole world. Uh, as I say, believe it or not, way, way back, you know, when I was uh, still a teenager, even at high school age, that was really where my own personal interest started with, with gardening with plants, was growing plants indoors. And of course, it's just branched out and become a lifetime pursuit since there. So I'm happy to be talking with you about this. Um, also, the whole thing about house plants, the amount of interest in this has just exploded over the last few years for lots of good reasons. And as Sally mentioned, uh, we're also going to be looking forward to taking uh, your questions and calls about really anything you want to share with relative to gardening, whether it's inside or outside. But again, we're going to kind of focus on the inside today. So kind of to start this uh, conversation off, I went for help. Uh, I went into the greenhouse and spoke with our one of our wonderful, uh, amazing greenhouse specialists in here. Uh, Jackie Pfeiffer, and let's kick this off a little interview with Jackie. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us to talk about houseplants. Uh, my name is David Yost with Maryfield Garden Center, and Jackie's joining us today uh, to talk about trends in houseplants. Now, a lot of you have heard that. Uh, there's been this resurgence of interest um, in house plants. This has been going on for two or three years. Uh, but Jackie's one of our wonderful greenhouse specialists. And Jackie, I kind of want your take on sort of what's driving this renewed interest in here, what people are looking for. And maybe start out just sharing your own experience of how you got started with your uh, fascination with growing house plants, tropical plants. Yeah, definitely. So, what got started for me was aloe vera. I was looking for one and I stumbled into a greenhouse and that was it for me. I saw all these luscious, beautiful plants everywhere and they just really made me happy. So did you have any previous experience or was this just a love at first sight kind of moment? Definitely a love at first sight. I just saw what I liked, took it home, took care of it. Some of them died because I didn't know how to care for them. Um, and then just kind of was self-taught after that. Now I have to tell you, just things I, I read in journals and articles, it sounds like some of the social media things influencing this. You know, what do you think is sort of driving suddenly this renewed interest? I have to say, I, I started out, I'm talking about in the 70s, right? really with indoor gardening and tropical plants. It kind of fell off the scene, but now it's back super strong. Definitely, so I would say, Instagram is definitely a key factor. Um, that's also what got started for me. That's where I saw this lovely Monstera at first was on Instagram. So it definitely fueled it for me as well. So when a lot of people are scrolling through Instagram, you tend to find a lot of plants that you like that we may not be able to either order for people or we just don't have them on hand. So it definitely fuels people's passion to find a certain plant though after a while. 
Yeah, I've seen like stuff, you know, bidding wars and crazy yes. pricing going on for single leaf cuttings and things. Definitely. Yeah. One that happens to be this beautiful Raven ZZ that kind of started that. So with this, this is a new type of ZZ plant. This is a Raven ZZ. So as you can see, the new growth starts to come out, this beautiful kind of limelight green color. And as it matures, it starts to turn black. So, you know, people might see this and be like, wow, this probably has a fungus or it's dying. But the beauty of this plant is that it starts from the green and turns to the black, uh, which I find very fascinating with this guy. Yeah, I've never seen that before today. That, that is fascinating. Of course, one of my favorite plants because it's about the easiest thing I think there is to take care of as well. I can definitely agree. And like you were saying before, bidding wars. So, you know, a year or two ago, this guy, um, for a single stem, it would go easily for over $100. So, you know, now that we're able to get these beautiful plants in for quite less than that, um, you really need to be patient sometimes if you don't want to pay that price. And then you can end up with a beautiful plant such as this. Now, you mentioned you were attracted to the Monstera, which to me, I think of as like an old fashioned plant. But right. it's like any style, it seems what goes around comes around and it's back in style. Exactly. I mean, how can you not love this? A lot of people like this kind of as a main attraction in your home when you want. So we're all stuck at home because of COVID. A lot of people wanted, you know, to care for plants. With this beauty, it gets huge leaves. I always tell people you really need to have room to grow this because it can get wide and it can also get very tall. So you really need to have good room for this guy over time. So if you look, these are the more juvenile leaves. They're not gonna have as many fenestrations or splits on them. And as the Monstera grows, gets proper lighting, feeding, watering, eventually you'll start to get these more mature leaves that will start to split and they are just a gorgeous piece to anybody's home and of course i think along at what i call the the swiss cheese plant oh yes this little beauty so with these ones this is on a totem pole so they grow a lot quicker and they get bigger leaf sizes as they grow you can let this hang down and it'll grow just as fine, but you might find it, it's not giving you very big leaves. So I would give it something to grow and it'll be a lot happier. Now, uh, another that I have customers coming in is everybody loves the uh, fiddle leaf fig. Again, just cause it's such a dramatic plant. Uh, I keep, I had one of these in my office in a previous job, but I, kept it in my cubicle for about seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. A lot of times, as we were discussing, this can be a very temper temperamental plant. If you don't provide sufficient lighting for this guy, it will drop leaves like crazy. If you move it too much, it'll drop leaves. So once you find a really happy spot with this for full sun, it'll do a lot better for you. Um, and you know, this is definitely a trendy plant. People love the shape of these leaves. People love them for, you know, photo shoots, a centerpiece in their room. Um, so, you know, it, it is a beautiful plant, but maybe hold off if you don't have enough sunlight. Yeah, the rest of the story, like I said, when I had this in my office for seven years, it looked horrible. I actually threw it into the dumpster and then <laughs> it was it. my uh, one of the office mates that actually rescued it from there and put it back. So I think it's a good point. You look at some of these plants on Instagram or social media and they look so beautiful and gorgeous and full and polished up. Right. But again, depending on the environment that you have, it may or may not work for you. Exactly. Another um, kind of example would be the Ficus triangularis variegata. So with this guy, so again, trend, variegation. We all love a good variegated plant with these ones. Sometimes they tend to need more sun because they don't have quite as much green. So again, with ficus, just really good full sun, allow it to dry out between waterings and you should be successful. Um, again, if you're looking for a low light plant, I would hold off and get the beautiful ZZ plant. Great. So maybe I know you've got some smaller plants where maybe if you don't have the amount of space for the plants we've been showing, and you can give us a little rundown of what's of interest there. So this, the Pilea peperomoides, or Chinese money plant. 
Um, people also refer to this as a friendship plant because as it grows and it likes to be nice and tight in its pot to get little pups to pop off on the sides and then you can put it in its own little pot and this one right here is also giving pups so they really like to be tight in their pots. I remember it was about a year ago, everybody was looking for these plants. We just couldn't get enough of them. They really are. So we're still kind of having a little bit of trouble getting in certain plants, um, but it's, it's getting a little easier for us. But these are very easy to care for. Everybody loves them. And let's just show one more, because we are going to run out of time, but Beautiful. a little bit of what we call our string of collections. So our string of things. So with the string of pearls, uh, these can be a little bit for an advanced plant grower. You can absolutely give it a try, but don't beat yourself up if you don't have success with this one. Um, even personal plant people I know who grow things have a hard time for this. So as you can see, these have beautiful little strands of pearls on them. Um, so these do hold moisture, so a lot of times when you're watering and watering and watering these can actually explode if they hold the water for too long so you know just really good bright sun and let it dry out in between waterings but this is very very trendy right now excellent and do we have anything else to show or anything you need to say before we have to wrap this up one of my personal favorites is the string of hearts this is a lot easier than the string of pearls you'll have great success with this um, not as picky as the string of pearls. So if you want to give a try at string of things, I would definitely do the string of hearts. Excellent. Well, this is fantastic. And of course, our greenhouse, we have so many more things to talk about. Uh, so it's just a little introduction. But do you have any last words to say or pointers for uh, anybody that might be new to this or getting started? I would say go easy. I always see people getting started with plant collections, have a cart that looked just like this, they get overwhelmed, they end up killing some plants. So, you know, just take it one step at a pot time, maybe go for something that's a little less maintenance, and then that way you're setting yourself up for success instead of failure. Um, but otherwise, have fun with it also. All right, thank you so much for taking your time to spend with us today. And please stop by and see us at Maryfield Garden Center. All three of our stores have a beautiful greenhouse to look through. Excellent. Well, I tell you, I, I learn more uh, every time I get to do one of these uh, videos or just to have a chance to stop and talk to my coworkers and see what's going on. So uh, so always appreciate that. Thanks, Jackie. And again, you know, we've got uh, greenhouses, all three of our stores. So so I watch that and it makes me want to go in and buy some plants. I hope it does the same for you. Uh, now, as I as everybody knows, I spend most of my time at the plant clinic uh, looking at insects, diseases and things that are going wrong. So that's where I, I'm going to begin my little part of this conversation. So one thing is uh, we're getting to that time of year when you do want to bring your tropical plants indoors. Uh, all these plants that we looked at, they're not going to survive in freezing temperatures. For us in this kind of western part of Fairfax County, where I'm sitting right now, our average uh, frost day is usually in late October, you know, around the October 20 or so. So it's right now you need to kind of start keeping an eye on the forecast and thinking about bringing the plants back indoors. Uh, so along with that, there are a few pest issues that I want to talk to you about to make sure that we don't run into any troubles here. So three of the more common uh, pests that we encounter on house plants or indoor plants, uh, talk to you a little bit about spider mites. Um, spider mites, you really are so small, you need a magnifying glass to see them. Obviously, these pictures are quite enlarged. By the time you see this kind of webbing form uh, and you can actually see the little mites running around, you've got a pretty significant problem on your hands. So we wanna catch this early in the game before it ever reaches this kind of population. And mites are pretty much generalists. They'll go after almost any type of plant. They're not all that choosy about which plant they latch onto. Up in this little inset in the corner, again, this is highly magnified. Uh, this, this is actually the egg. Looks like a tiny, tiny little marble. You absolutely have to have magnification to see that. 
And then these are the adult mites. Their mouth part, which you can't see right here, their mouth part's like a little pincher. And so what they do is they basically, they bite into the plant tissue and suck the sap out of it. So as they're drawing that sap out of the plant, the leaves start to get this speckled look or sometimes referred to as this stippled look. Um, on the underside, the leaves is generally where they concentrate. And you look under there a lot of times, it just has this kind of dusty appearance. And then we look closer up and you'll actually see those mites in there. Mites can go from egg to an adult and as quick as about 10 days. And so when it's, when it's indoors in the winter with low humidity and warm temperatures, these populations build up very, very rapidly. So that's something we want to keep an eye out for. Now, mealybug and scale are two closely related insects. These are also what we call piercing sucking type of insect. Their mouth is like a little syringe that they're going to stick into that leaf and sit there and draw and suck sap out of the tissue also. Mealybug is this white one. A lot of times people think it's some kind of mold or some type of disease. But if you look up close, these are individual insects and they cover themselves with this kind of white waxing material as their protective cover. Over on the other side, this is a, what's called a brown soft scale. Same habits, but instead of that white, um, that white cottony kind of cover, they have this more smooth waxy cover on there. So again, you don't recognize them necessarily as insects because all their, their the three segmented bodies, the six legs, all that stuff is atrophy and it's covered underneath this shell and they're sedentary. They just stay underneath there. They hunker down and sit there and draw sap. As they're sucking the sap and juices out of the plant, not only are they stressing the plant, but sometimes you'll, they'll produce this sticky residue. Uh, I know when I had a big plant collection, I'd be walking around and you know, your, your shoes are kind of sticking to the floor. It feels a little tacky. Well, at that point, you know, you pretty much know you've got these pests in there. You look closer. Again, we, we hope we can catch it before that point. Then if you get that residue buildup, then you start to get this black mold developing. Again, not that this is parasitizing the plant, but it is growing on the residue that's created by these mealybug and scale pests. And then, of course, there's many things, you know, that, that can go wrong, but I'm just hitting the common ones are fungus gnats. Uh, fungus gnats, you can see from that image, they're also very small. They don't bite, they don't sting, they don't really cause any trouble at all, but they're a nuisance. Uh, they're, they're attracted to bright light. So as our days get shorter and we're inside and sometimes we have more plants inside and then they start getting attracted to the lights. You're sitting there at the dining room table trying to have a meal and these little gnats buzzing around. Uh, so nobody really enjoys having them in the house, but there's nothing necessarily to be afraid of. Their larvae develop down in the soil. So down in the soil where the organic matter is, it's warm, it's moist, they're feeding on this decaying organic matter that's down in the soil. And then they emerge out as these uh, gnats to fly around and just become annoying. So these are the pests that I see most frequently on the house plants. So one of the things I wanted to mention is you can consider, um, well, first of all, before you bring your plants inside, try to take the time to do a careful inspection. Look on them. These pests tend to be on the underside of the leaf where it's protected. They get into little nooks and crannies, little hiding spaces uh, that are in there. So you gotta do a close inspection. And sometimes even like the mealybug is the most notorious, they can actually live outside the pot. So they can be down in the sauce or the tray or underneath the pot or something like that. So you can do a close inspection uh, and just make sure the pots are clean before you bring them inside. A lot of people like to spray their plants as a preventative measure before coming indoors. And I think that's a good idea. So I want to show you some of the choices that you have available. Now the, um, and, and there's no right answer for anybody, but that's why I'm showing you two or three options. This is the, uh, the all season spray oil. This is a highly refined petroleum oil. It's a natural product, uh, but when you spray the plant, you're spraying the top and the bottom and all the little nooks and crannies, the water evaporates out. And then this film of oil through a process of desiccation and suffocation 
essentially it will take care of mites, it takes care of scales, it takes care of aphids, uh, it um, works on a lot of these different pests, uh, and it's a natural product. Another one that I like to use if you want as a precaution on the plants is this uh, from BioAdvanced, the Rosenflower Insect Killer. This is also labeled for use on house plants. Um, it has two different insecticides in here. It has one, which is a contact insecticide. You spray it, it kills the insects. It also has a systemic component that's absorbed into the leaf tissue. So it continues to remain effective for up to 30 days after that. So this is a great product, colorless, odorless, um, gives us good results. But I, would, I always like to give you sort of a natural option, which might be the oil, um, or in this case, if they want to go the, the uh, more conventional route, this rose and flower is a good option. Now, these are things, you know, you can spray your plants, um, just let it sit on there until it dries, that might be an hour or two, and then bring them inside. So you can kind of, you don't have to be prepared that far in advance. I'm going to show you two more products and I always try, um, I want to give information an option, but not make it too confusing or overwhelming. So this is a, um, a systemic granule. This we don't have to spray, but it's, uh, we just put these down in the pot, in the soil, and as you water the plant, it goes into the soil and it's absorbed up through the roots. I'm showing this because if you have trouble with fungus gnats or history problems with fungus gnats, we're finding this is probably one of the more effective treatments and also one of the easier, more convenient ones to use. Because again, if we're spraying the plant, that's for pests that are on the plant, it really doesn't control insects that are in the soil. And one last thing I'll say, and then I'll let go of this topic, uh, because we're always concerned that if, if you have a history or if there's any evidence of you bringing ants or pill bugs or uh, something like that, that's nesting centipedes, it's actually nesting down in the soil and we need to do a soil treatment. Um, we also have what's called eight, just like the number eight, E-I-G-H-T. This is mixed according to the directions. They'll give you the recipe in here for they call a container drench. Um, you mix this in a watering can and pour it through the soil, and that way, if ants or pill bugs and stuff is in there, um, that's control that's there. So most importantly, I don't expect uh, you to know this, and I don't expect you have to use all this, but just stop by and see us if you have any of these concerns, we can go through and present what options are available to you. One other little thing I want to say before we start on the questions. Uh, I always say plants have to acclimate to their environment. Uh, we all know that. So if you've had plants that are outdoors uh, and they've been in the warmth and the sunshine, the high humidity, uh, they've in ideal growing conditions, when we bring those plants back indoors and it's going into winter time, the days are getting shorter. Uh, you've got lower light levels because it's inside, lower humidity as the heat comes on. We move into a less favorable environment Many times these plants, you're gonna see yellowing, shedding leaves because if I'm outside in 12 hours of bright indirect light and high humidity, and I come inside into you know, six hours of indirect light and low humidity, it just can't sustain all that foliage. And you're gonna see yellowing and shedding. So that's kind of a normal process of bringing plants inside. It doesn't mean that they're sick or that they're dying. They just have to reacclimate to kind of their indoor environment. Plants that need very bright, sunny conditions, like I bought my gardenia in here as an example, are going to show this most significantly. Citrus trees, hibiscus, the things that we put out there for beautiful flowers in the summertime, they really need bright, sunny conditions. So if you're fortunate enough to have that indoors, um, then you're going to just have better results. Uh, most of us, we bring them in in sort of less than ideal conditions. And that's when the yellowing and the shedding and all that kind of stuff begins. All right, I think that's kind of a good intro to what we're talking about today. Uh, so Sally, do we have any questions? We sure do. And I just want to let everybody know, because we've already got a good number that have come in. If we're not able to answer your questions today, if you're on uh, Zoom, you can hit reply to your confirmation email, send us those questions if we don't get to them. Uh, if you're on Facebook, I suggest going to our website and filling out the contact us form at the bottom of the page that goes to my one of my colleagues who actually is usually 
behind the camera. Um, so we'll make sure that we get those through. So um, David, we have a few questions about some pet safe stuff. So for the products that you were recommending, um, if people have pets, do they need to take any considerations uh, if they have pets that like to munch on leaves or eat or dig in dirt um, for like the systemic products or any of those sprays? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you need to be aware of that and take precautions with it. Now, all the things I showed you, none, all these have the lowest risk rating, what we call kind of a caution rating. But having said that, I realized, you know, with, with pets inside the house and small children, we kind of have a zero tolerance condition. So that's really why I like the horticultural oil that I've mentioned. This is a natural product. There's really no residual with it. And it really, there's no problems with it, even if, if there is. So this is a great option, I think, to consider because it does work on a broad range of insects. Uh, once it's dried, you can bring the house, plant back inside the house and there's really no risk to people, pets or children in any form with it. The other products I would be uh, more cautious about. Okay. You know, if your animals want to chew on the leaves or kids in the area, let's just leave the other stuff out of the conversation. Will that product uh, work on the spider mites, mealybugs, and scale? Yes, works on all of the above. Great, fabulous. And more. Great, awesome. Um, okay, uh, next question is, um, okay, so people who are getting ready to bring their plants inside, uh, what's a good schedule for that? Can you just bring them in and they stay in, or do you need to kind of bring them in and bring them back out like you would do if you're bringing them out for the summer, acclimating them to the light? No, I would. Basically, once they come indoors, they're coming indoors uh, for the rest of winter. Like I said most of these things, you know, you'll want to have them inside before the end of the month. Now, you really watch your local weather forecast because it's always unpredictable and it's variable. Uh, if, if I see temperatures, they're going down to like 40 or below, then they are definitely coming inside. A lot of people like to bring them in even at 50 degrees. So we're, we're in that point where some people have already started bringing them in. But if you want to, I mean, you can kind of bring a plant outside on a nice day, but I think it's really best if you bring them inside, let them acclimate the indoor conditions, then next spring, sometime in May, we'll go outside and let them acclimate to that. Changing conditions on the plants is a little bit stressful. Got it. Um, can you discuss humidity? So I know if someone has more or less humid conditions in their house, how does that affect the health of the plant? And are there any ways you can work around that to help it if you have a plant that needs more humidity in the winter. Right, so again, most of these plants are coming from tropical regions where we're talking about 70, 80, 90 percent humidity and that's the kind of conditions where they're going to thrive. Uh, we have those conditions in the summertime around here but when we come inside in the winter and then we turn the heat on, uh, our humidity levels can go considerably lower than that. So I, I didn't necessarily bring it in, but there's a couple of things that you can do. There's what we call a humidity tray or pebble tray, where you actually put a, a saucer into the plant, put pebbles inside that saucer, and then set your plant inside. Then as moisture evaporates out of that little saucer, you put water, that can increase the humidity. Misting the plants frequently, just with a mister, I'm always about that. It doesn't that's really short term. It doesn't last very long, but it, it's, you know, the plants appreciate it. And my third idea is when you bunch plants together, like I have here on the desk. Now, this is probably a little crowded, but when they're together, then they kind of, at least locally, they sort of increase the humidity for each one of them. So, so a lot of times, anything you can do to improve the humidity is going to improve the um, health of the plants. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so... Um, Next question is about watering. So the, this person is specifically asking about the fiddle leaf figs, um, but it may be useful, I have a feeling, for it to address if there are any general watering rules. I know succulents are probably different. So um, if you have any general watering rules for rules of thumb for these plants. Yeah, I do, and, and, and I say this is uh, similar whether we're growing inside or outside. I like to emphasize that when we water, we want to water thoroughly. So for example, if I'm watering this little begonia, you know, I've got drainage holes and the, well, this actually has a little saucer, but there's holes in there. I want to water until that water is moving through the entire soil profile to where I know 
hey, this thing is watered from top to bottom. I'm not just trying to put half a cup or a quarter cup or an ice cube or something crazy like that. I want to water it until this whole soil profile is saturated, but I don't water it again until it starts to feel slightly dry. So over watering, I always emphasize is watering too frequently. It's not that I really watered it too much. It means I'm watering it too often. And that's making sure that excess water can drain through the pot. Now, there, the individual plants have differences, like you, know, you had mentioned, Sally, of succulents. Succulents want to go you know, almost completely dry before they get watered again. I think it was, a, was it the ficus, the fiddle leaf fig we had asked about? You know, that, that's, that's one. Right. Yes. Yes. So that, that can be a, a little bit of a temperamental plant. I say temperamental, whenever they're unhappy, they shed a leaf. Uh, but I like to let that one go not, not dry like a succulent dry or dry like a ZZ plant. See, I love my little, little dwarf ZZ plant. Uh, some of these things like ZZ plant, the Sansevieria that I've got right here. These we grow just like it was succulent cactus. We let them go completely dry. And that's why they're so easy. They're so forgiving. Something like ficus, whether it's, uh, you know, ficus elastica, the rubber plant, or ficus lyrata, you say the fiddle leaf fig. I'm going to water them, but not to the extent where the pot comes completely dry. Um, there's different ways to do this. I might stick my finger in there is an easy one. And if I go down two or three inches and, and it's the top few inches is dry, then it's time to water again. Uh, if you can feel the weight of the pot, it's hard to tell. This takes a little trial and error, but don't let it go completely dry, but just slightly dry between watering. And then there's other plants. I'll just say like spathophyllum, which I don't have here, a little bit like the aglaonemia. They, they kind of want to be kept a little more moist. So this is a learning process. Some plants um, will go completely dry. Some of them will stay, you know, consistently moist. But then, like I said, the ficus is going to kind of fall in between. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I once had a Sansevieria plant that I might have forgotten the water for three months, and it did fine. So those things are pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, tell, that's the plant. That's what I grow. Exactly. It was a good one. Yeah. Um, okay, the next question is about bringing in the hibiscus. Um, and I imagine other people may have dealt with these issues with some of these types of plants. Um, they find that whatever they bring the hibiscus in, it never really survives or does very well. Um, are there any common issues you experience when you're trying to bring these tropical plants in and overwinter them? What's, what are some common issues or is there anything they can do about that? Yeah. They're, they are definitely a challenge. So things like uh, mandevilla, the, the hibiscus, these are sun-loving, warmth-loving tropical plants. And my goal a lot of times is try to get them to survive through the winter. Not, not that it's going to be a beautiful thing. You bring them inside, they yellow, they shed, they stop flowering. Uh, we're just kind of hoping that maybe we can get survive and then put it back outside next spring. So some of this is adjusting your expectations. Uh, now, if, if you happen to have a sunroom kind of condition, a really good strong lights, uh, then plants like citrus trees, you know, lemons and oranges and hibiscus and everything, you can actually keep them growing, uh, keep them blooming, uh, but you gotta have really bright sunny conditions a uh, hibiscus is one that if, if you let it dry out, you will know immediately, you know, it yellows, sheds, drops, um, wilts. So hibiscus, you want to check it frequently, kind of keep it uniformly moist as best as you can and as bright as sunny conditions you can. If you don't have that environment, and many of us don't, uh, I do know people have been able to successfully get hibiscus through even in a garage type of environment, you know, where you still have a window, where you've still got some sunlight on there, we're still keeping temperatures above 40 degrees, it's gonna yellow shed, it's gonna look pretty awful. You're gonna water very little, just enough to stop it from completely drying out. And at this point, you're just hoping to get it survived till spring. One last thing I wanna say about hibiscus is they are notorious um, for having aphids and spider mites on them. So that's one that uh, spraying prior to bringing in can also save you some trouble. All right, great, thank you. Um, okay, next question is about lemon and lime trees. So we'll move on to that. They're gonna bring their lemon and limes in. 
Um, they think they have ants. Can you use can use the eight product on those lemon and lime trees to get deal with the ants before bringing it in? Um, yes, you can. This um, what I'm calling the you know eight. There is a um, on the instructions on back here. They have a they tell you basically how to mix such. I'm going to get wrong, so I won't even say it. But they tell you the mixing rate that's in here. You put it into a watering can and drench it through the pots. This is before you bring them inside. All this is done outdoors. So you drench it through the pot, let this um, insecticide go all the way through the soil, drain completely, dry completely. Then you can bring the plants inside. Uh, this is labeled for use on fruits and vegetables. Um, it's a synthetic you know, or chemical insecticide, but it is approved for use on fruits and vegetables and is kind of the lowest risk rating. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Uh, next question is from Facebook. We have um, a person who got a gardenia from Maryfield and it's doing really well. They have it out on, I think, their balcony or a patio or deck. Oh, um, good for you. They're going to bring it in. Or they, I guess they wanted to hang on. Let me check this again and see. I have an all seasons gardenia from Maryfield that's thriving. Should it come in or can I leave it out in a sunny position? Yeah. Uh, so when you say all seasons, see, we have some gardenias that can live outside for the winter. Uh, so those we sell in the shrub section. So I think that's what we're talking about. Uh, we have others, the tropical ones like you see here, which you buy in the greenhouse. This guy would definitely need to come inside. But let's assume that it's um, it is one that it is one of those varieties that you bought out in the shrub department. They are still marginal in their winter hardiness, and the fact that it's in a container, it's above ground, and you're in a balcony, it's going to be more exposed to temperature and moisture extremes. So I would say yes, leave it outside. But I think it would also be worthwhile to insulate that pot. Uh, which means anything from wrapping bubble wrap around it or around here, we just take uh, mulch bags and pile it up there. Uh, you can do frost cloth, but uh, something to protect it, to give it some additional insulation around the root zone. Also, uh, larger pots, you know, are better insulated than small pots. So that's a factor to consider in there. So kind of wrap it up, you know, for, and, and you don't need to think about this until Christmas time. So it's not urgent. But before it gets really cold, you know, before January, you know, wrap it, insulate it, check it, you know, at least once every three or four weeks that it doesn't um, doesn't go completely dry. So so give it some TLC and it should make it through the winter. All right. Thank you, David. Um, OK, next question is back to the fungus gnats. Are they related at all to fruit flies? Are they similar? Uh, well, they're both flies, so they're they're related in that they're in the same order, but that's where, kind of where the similarity begins and ends. Uh, people get them confused all the time. There are there are traps that will capture fruit flies, and there's traps that will capture fungus gnats. The fruit flies really do feed on decaying, rotting fruit. So I know sometimes in my little compost bucket or something, you know, I might uh, start to see a few of them there. Uh, I shouldn't say, but here at the employee lunchroom, we got them flying around, but that's from people kind of leaving food lying around. And that's, I, I'm saying more of a kitchen pest. The fungus gnats look similar. Uh, they don't fly quite as well. They kind of bumble around like a gnat does. They're smaller and they are developing in the soil of plants. All right, thanks, David. Um, okay, next question is actually about an African, the African violet. Uh, if someone has powdery mildew on their African violet, what's the best remedy for that? Is that we were actually getting African violet questions on our last class on houseplants? So. Yeah, um, that's that's just a. I'm going to say when I say it's a little bit tricky because things like the, uh, the horticultural oil, neem oil. Uh, are labeled for use uh, for controlled mildew. Uh, I've used them on African violets. They don't damage the plant. But the problem is these oil-based materials will ruin the flowers. So if it's in bloom, that's kind of a tough one to deal with. Sometimes if the mildew is like uh, aggressive or if it's spreading, you might even have to consider sacrificing the flowers. Uh, so I like to use, like I said, either neem oil or uh, horticultural oil as the control measure. But if I can, I'd much rather do that when it's not during the bloom cycle. All right. Thanks, David. Okay. The next question, and I'm sorry, you may have to follow up. Um, so here's this person's question. Uh, I'll just read it. 
and uh, we may need some clarification on it. But what type of soil should I use for my Kalanchoa plants? I have a large container with four of these that I want to bring inside for the winter. So I'm not sure if she maybe wants to repot them, um, if she's bringing them in. Yeah, so those, those do best um, in the uh, cactus and succulent mix. Now that's, again, a really super easy plant to grow. It's not going to be fussy about anybody. If, if you don't know, so this is Kalanchoe right here. It's kind of succulent. It's in there. Um, long bloom season uh, and everything. So if you're going to be repotting them, just any brand of uh, cactus and succulent mix, mix will, will do great. If you've just got general use kind of um, potting mix, again, these plants are not fussy and they, that would work also. Okay, thanks, David. All right, uh, next question. We have a begonia that has enjoyed a wonderful summer and grown quite large. If we try to bring it in, are we better off pruning it back severely or just rooting some of the shoots as new plants? Hmm, which would I do? Could do both, uh, prune it back and then root the cuttings that are in there. Uh, probably your best chance of success, your most, well, I'll say your kind of essentially guaranteed success would be to cut the plant back. Because again, most begonias will, pretty much all begonias will do that. You can cut them back and then they'll re-sprout from wherever you made the cuttings. And then you've got a full established mature root system. Uh, but begonias also propagate pretty well from leaf cuttings. So if you chose to, uh, just like I'm going to use this begonia as an example, of uh, you could cut it back and then even some of these individual leaves, uh, if you lay them down on some potting soil, maybe even use a little bit of rooting hormone uh, and keep it uh, in high humidity, you can actually root these from individual cuttings. So uh, just all out there is available to you. This isn't a real begonia, this is strawberry begonia since we kind of opened that discussion. Again, what's so great is this spreads by these um, stolons and little baby plants. Of course, this, you know, these things can be cut off and propagated real easily, just potted up. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't seen that plant before. It looks like- oh, This is like one of my old time favorites. Again, this guy is, it's been around for forever, but uh, they call it strawberry begonia. I don't think it's true begonia, but it's nice. Poor it produces little tendrils, gets little pups on there. Oh, it's cool. a okay. Grown. Um, all right, next question. This person specifically asking about African violet soil, but I think it probably applies. Can you use to multiple types of soil? Um, can you use African violet soil for other kinds of house plants? And is there any type of potting mix that's better than others in terms of nutrient value? And I know you choose some mixes over others for their various compositions. Um, right. So, yeah, and that's really the biggest difference between, you know, the different potting mixes, how well they drain or what their moisture or water holding capacity is. So plants like African violets that, uh, that don't, that won't tolerate wet soils. If you put African violet and that soil has a tendency to retain moisture, um, that African violet is pretty much dead. It's on there. So a lot of the African violet soils, they may add or mix a little bit of grit in there to enhance drainage. I was saying the, the cactus and succulent soils, it's the same thing. They mix sand in there to enhance the drainage in there. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with switching between them. I mean, I could grow a philodendron in an African violet soil. I just may find I have to water it more frequently. Uh, but so these specialty mixes, they, they are changed the composition. Uh, really, mostly as it affects drainage. I think you were asking about the nutrients in there. It's been a trend over the last 10 years or so that pretty much all the soils now have some amount of fertilizer mixed in with them also as a nutrient supplement. A uh, real big thing right now is we've got organic soils, for example, but they're using an organic fertilizer, whereas others might use a slow release fertilizer and some have water soluble. So there you uh, experiment, try around some different things. Uh, we're actually, you know, looking and evaluating our own Merrifield potting mix, uh, which I tend to use mostly outdoors or plants. It actually is designed to have good moisture retention in there. So plants that tolerate or plants that want, not tolerate plants that want moist conditions, but African violets, succulents, uh, those things I'd rather uh, go with 
you know, ProMix is a great one. You know, we sell Espoma, some of the cactus succulents. I don't get too hung up on the name. Thanks, David. All right, it's 2.45, but we have one more question. Um, can you bring in geraniums and overwinter those? Oh, yes, you can. Uh, some people, the, the garden geraniums are, are actually successful where you can literally just kind of lift them out of the ground. Uh, the old thing is people would just take them and hang them upside down in, uh, in a basement or, you know, they say root cellar, that's going way back. Uh, and they'll basically just rest dormant uh, through the winter time, and then they can be replanted next spring, you'll have a certain amount of loss rate. So if you keep it as a potted plant, where you just pot them up, keeping a sunny windowsill, you know, water when they start to feel slightly dry, uh, they can be grown, but it is a highlight plant once it's as bright and sunny location as you can provide. They also propagate pretty easily from cutting. So there's lots of ways to get that through. All right, thank you, David. I know we're about out of time now. Um, so if anybody has any questions following class, again, please feel free to follow up with us. And David, is there anything that you would like to uh, close out with before we wrap up for the day? No, just um, I kind of reiterate what uh, Jack Hughes telling us. If you're kind of new to this, I like to build on success. So start with some of the easy plants, um, get some experience, build some success. Uh, and then gradually work your way up to some larger, more expensive or more temperamental things. But, but most of all, just come in, stop by, see us, talk to our greenhouse people and add a little color to your life. And uh, see you all in a couple of weeks. Definitely. Thank you, David. Everybody have a good day. Thanks.